Hi everyone, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Hi everyone, my name is Pierce and I'm the director of the Transnational Literature Series here at Brooklyn Booksmith and your host for tonight's conversation. I want to open up the space by saying thank you for coming out tonight. The Booksmith has been around since 1961 and that's because of our wonderful community. Your support means we can keep having events like this, so thank you again. As you may know, tonight's event is part of our ongoing Transnational Literature Series, which focuses on stories of migration, the intersection of politics and literature, and works in translation. If you enjoyed tonight's event, please check out our full events lineup online at booklinebooksmith.com so you don't miss some of the amazing authors we have coming up this spring, both virtually and in store. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram for updates. Toward the end of the event, we will leave about 15 minutes or so for an audience Q&A, followed by a signing. We have copies of Kilometer 101 and Rock, Paper, Scissors available over at the register. And please take a moment to silence your cell phones. I think that takes care of the business end of things. So now I'd love to tell you a little bit about our guests. Tonight I have the very great honor of introducing author Maxime Osipov and moderator Becca Rothfeld, here to discuss and celebrate the release of Kilometer 101, a new collection of short stories and essays that tackle major questions of modern life in and beyond Russia with Maxime's trademark blend of daring and subtlety. Kilometer 101 is edited by Boris Belyuk, who we so admire here at the series, and it's translated from Russian by a phenomenal team, including Boris Strelyuk, Alex Fleming, and Nikolas Pasternak Slater. Maxim Osipov is a, is a Russian writer and cardiologist. In the early 1990s, he was a research fellow at the University of California, San Francisco, before returning to Moscow, where he continued to practice medicine and also founded a publishing house that specialized in medical, musical, and theological texts. In 2005, while working at a local hospital in Tarusa, a small town 90 miles from Moscow, Maxim established a charitable foundation to ensure the hospital's survival. Since 2007, he has published short stories, novellas, essays, and plays, and has won a number of literary prizes for his fiction. He has published six collections of prose, and his plays have been staged all across Russia. Maxim's writings have been translated into more than a dozen languages, he lived in Tarusa until February 2022, and he now lives in Amsterdam. And tonight's moderator, Becca Rothfeld, is an essayist, critic, and contributing editor at The Point and the Boston Review. Her work has appeared in The New Yorker, The New York Times Book Review, The New York Review of Books, and The Yale Review, among others. Her debut essay collection is forthcoming from Holt. In 2021, she was an inaugural recipient of the Robert B. Silvers Prize for Literary Criticism and she is in the process of finishing a PhD in philosophy at Harvard. I'm so pleased to have them here together in conversation. And now Maxine and Becca. Awesome. We're gonna begin with Irina, I think. Yeah, that worked. I was told. Yes. Uh, I will read, uh, there is a very short and very unusual uh, story uh, for me, unusual because I, wrote it really very quickly. Uh, in Russian, it's Balshi uh, In English, it's uh, Big Opportunities. And I uh, wrote it uh, in September 2021. And there is an interesting political, uh, political uh, story behind it. Uh, so I will tell the story uh, later on when, when we are done with reading. Uh, so I always read in Russian to avoid, uh, in order to avoid comical effects. Uh, and, but uh, uh, but then, uh, Susan Barber will read it in English. Uh, the whole the whole thing. Uh, this story has only three paragraphs, so I will read uh, just one paragraph in Russian. Большие возможности. Вообразите себе возможности. Скоро у него будут большие, практически неограниченные возможности. Он настаивал именно на возможностях, которые перед ним откроются непременно, причем в самые ближайшие времена. Пусть она имеет в виду, говорил он, что у него все хорошо и теперь, прямо отлично, много лучше, во всяком случае, чем она может себе представить. Она, разумеется, никак не представляла себе ни теперешних его возможностей, ни тем более тех, на которые он намекал. Ей всего-то надо было от него, чтобы довез поскорее. Сейчас не вспомнишь, куда, в редакцию, в гости, в театр. Ей что же выходит неинтересно послушать, кто он такой? О, она, кажется, знает, но не станет произносить. Еще один приставучий, болтливый водитель, гордончик. 
одно из нескольких слов по-армянски, жаргонных, которым ее научили друзья. Грудончик, несмотря на проблемы с гласными, куда благозвучнее и ласковее, чем бомбила по-нашему, хотя означает ровно то самое. Это Москва, каждый второй автомобиль тут такси, только поднимешь руку и сколько, а сколько дашь? Нет, он не бомбила. Это все продолжает бубнить. И машина, на которой они сейчас едут, она не его собственная, а служебная. У него самого имеется совершенно другая тачка, другой, как он выразился, аппарат. Но он не собирается его на наших колдобинах убивать. А подобрал он ее не потому, что нуждается в деньгах, с ударением на первый слог. Очень по местечковому, хотя уж кем-кем, а евреем он быть не мог. Но и на русского не похож. Коми, Чуваш, Удмур, маленький, но с громадными, по его словам, возможностями впереди. Быстрый, дробный такой говорок, и быстрая, но аккуратная в целом манера вождения. Лицо хоть и не безобразное, но и не выражающее ничего. Ему, продолжает он, полагается личный водитель. Однако он предпочитает все делать самостоятельно. Уж не ради таких ли вот встреч. Впрочем, есть какое дело, остановить его там. Так она пообедать, поужинать, вместе покушать. О, Господи, в зеркало давно смотрел на себя. Нет-нет, зачем обижать? Да и его ухаживание, так это назовем, было не наглым, а каким-то наивным, автоматическим, глупым до чрезвычайности. Не удар, не ум, не талант, а большие возможности. Вот чем он пытался ее соблазнить, привлечь. Из человечества, пожалуй, что только дефект речи, детский какой-то. Он смешно выговаривал букву «Ша». Попробовала оставить ему то ли 200 рублей, то ли 20 тысяч. Она совершенно не помнит, какие суммы были тогда в ходу. Отказался. Сунул ей карточку с личным номером. Сказал, он этот номер вообще никому не дает. Никогда. Почти. Так что, если она передумает, о, непременно. Мерси. Opportunities, you understand? Soon he'd have enormous, almost limitless opportunities. He kept insisting on those opportunities. Opportunities that would open up for him soon, that lay just around the corner. She should know, though, he added, that he was doing just fine as it was, better than fine, better in any case than she could imagine. She, of course, hadn't the slight, slightest intention of imagining his current opportunities, much less the ones at which he was hinting. All she needed was for him to deliver her as quickly as possible. Who can remember where, after all this time? The editorial office, a party, the theater. So what, she doesn't want to hear who he is? Oh, she knows well enough, but she won't say it. Another annoying, chatty driver, a gurdonchik, one of a handful of words of Armenian slang she picked up from friends. Despite the cluster of consonants, Gurdonchik was still, in her opinion, far more euphonious, more affectionate than the Russian Bongila, although it meant exactly the same thing, an unlicensed cabbie. This is Moscow in the 90s. Every other car is a cab. Raise your hand and someone's right there. How much? How much can you spare? No, he's no Bombila, the fellow yammers on, and this isn't his car. He gets this one through his job. His own vehicle is totally different, of a whole other order, and he isn't about to ruin it on these roads. He didn't pick her up for the money either, pronounced either, with a kind of Jewish intonation, though he clearly isn't a Jew. Then again, he also doesn't look Russian, maybe Komi, Chuvash, Udmurt, a small man, but with enormous, in his words, opportunities ahead of him, a rapid, choppy, choppy manner of speech, matched by a rapid, though generally careful manner of driving, a face that isn't exactly ugly, just expressionless. He's entitled, he says, to a personal driver, but he prefers to do everything himself. For the sake of encounters like this, maybe. But what's it to her? Stop over there. So that's it? Maybe she'd like to have lunch or dinner, get a meal together. Oh God, have you looked at yourself in the mirror? No, she doesn't want to offend him. His courtship, let's call it, wasn't arrogant, but rather naive, automatic, terribly foolish. He tried to seduce her not with a show of prowess, of wit, or of talent, but with big opportunities. The only appealingly human thing about him was his speech impediment, a childish one. His S's sounded like sh. She had tried to leave him 200 or maybe 20,000. She can't remember what the money was worth back then, but he refused to take it. 
Instead, he handed her a card with his personal number, saying he never gave this number out to anyone, hardly ever, so if she happened to change her mind, oh, certainly, merci. Victories of this sort don't bring even a hint of joy, and she would never have remembered the pint-sized gardonchi, considering the number of men who had hit on her before and after, although seldom quite so clumsily, if not for an incident, an occurrence that changed her life forever. They showed up at her door early in the morning, six men and a dog, put her 18-year-old daughter in a car and took her away, and then they turned the apartment upside down. She was having the place renovated, and it had seemed to her that it couldn't be made more of a mess than it already was, but apparently it could. She was afraid for her daughter, felt all this was happening to someone else, not to them, not to her, and was ashamed, embarrassed by the piles of underwear, old letters, photographs. She also knew she needed to fight, of course, to call lawyers, to say nasty things to these goons, but her life seemed to be over. What are you looking for, gentlemen? Gentlemen, right. Listen, on what basis are you searching my apartment? On the basis of an order, see for yourself. Extremism, terrorism, anarchism, social media records. When the time comes, she'll hear all about it. The dog alone behaved itself more or less decently, walked around, sniffed a few things, then plopped down. She gave it some water. What's this, the one in charge asks her, sounding for the first time the least bit interested. A real professional, he had found a card in the lining of an old purse. Name, surname, number, that very card. Give it here, she snatches it from his hands, and without giving herself time to figure out what exactly she wants to say, makes the call. Yish, with the characteristic shh. Their conversation hardly lasts two minutes, and she's the only one talking. Tears, vows, pleas, not the moment for shyness or discretion. He finally says in the same dispassionate tone in which he told her about his opportunities, pass the phone to the one in charge. The man goes out, then comes back. All right, we'll lock her up for a long time if she doesn't leave the country by Tuesday. Never call that number again, got it? He grins. Go over to the station and pick up your darling. Caesar, come. They leave. Life's fucking sense. A half-finished inscription on a fence, author unknown. The good things, the best ones, are often anonymous. A number of years passed, quite a few years, because her daughter had since managed to graduate from the university in Lille, while the daughter's Moscow friends and acquaintances, boys and girls from good families just like hers, had managed to serve out their sentences in prisons and camps. They were given from seven to 12 years, while after numerous adventures and travels, she herself had ended up in her own house in the, house, in the south of France. And of course, all these years, she'd been following peripherally, out of the corner of her eye, the career of, it must be said, her benefactor, the Bombila, the Gordonchik, following it with horror, since here and there, in Africa, Asia, and even at home, he was invariably to be found at the center of some unthinkable, unimaginable evil, in violation of all divine and human laws. Until finally she comes across an announcement that he's been awarded a hero's gold star, his second, this time, however, posthumously. In an attempt to save the crew, and so on and so forth, implausible nonsense without even a single believable detail, which is, of course, never the point. He died a hero's death, along with some number of people. And to her, as to all commentators, it's perfectly obvious that all this official chatter is intended only to conceal, to drown in itself the shameful, disgusting truth of what had actually happened, a drunken death while out hunting, a political murder, or something of that sort. How strange, she thinks. He's lying there in a deluxe coffin, powdered and made up, with his enormous, limitless opportunities, waiting to be buried in the best cemetery next to writers, artists, and composers, all to the sounds of beautiful music that he probably never liked. And what would she want to find out? And would she want to find out that the announcement of his death was false? No, better not to ask oneself such a question. He had done her a favor, been good to her, while to everyone else, judging by the terrible things they write and say about him, he had been exclusively bad. All right, does she feel sorry for this little man with his childish speech impediment? After all, she owes a great, very, 
a very great deal to him, if not her own life, her daughter's freedom, the south of France. Maybe she does feel sorry, a little. story behind it is that uh, I have a friend, uh, a woman, very handsome, uh, who uh, told me a story uh, that, you know, we rarely have seen television, Russian television, while we were in Russia, uh, of course. And uh, she said that maybe at barber shop, or I, I forgot where, uh, she uh, saw Russian TV and she saw Shaigu, you know, Shaigu is a minister of uh, offense, uh, of uh, defense, sorry. Yeah. In, in fact, it's offense, yeah. And so Shaigu has this funny speech impediment. He says, instead of saying R, in Russian we say R, Rasiya, Tavarishi, you know, Kukuruza, whatever. Uh, yeah, he says R, like, like in English uh, manner. You know, which is very unusual. And uh, she remembered that in the 90s, it was him who uh, uh, you know, took her from somewhere, uh, she, she doesn't know where, uh, these days, and who tried to seduce her in a way uh, you know, of telling her about his big, limitless opportunities ahead of him. And, and it was so stupid that, you know, she, of course, she you know, recalled that and she told it to me. And I, I, I found it very remarkable and uh, I decided to put it into my diary. And then after writing, you know, the first paragraph, I just thought about, you know, continuation this story uh, might have. So that's, that's the story of, of this story. Did have big opportunities. Yeah, in fact, he was quite right. <laughs> um, okay, well, I have a question about something totally unrelated, okay. uh, which is the irritating, inevitable question about being a doctor. I'm sorry. So you said in an interview in The New Yorker uh, that this kind of question involves an unpleasant confusion of genres. A doctor should be a kind of neutral creature without gender, religious belief, ideas about politics. But a writer is very present in this way. It's all there to see. So naturally, I feel compelled to ask about being a doctor. Uh, and this seems like one of the two professions that writers have, the other being insurance, of course, Kafka, sure. Wallace Stevens. So not just Chekhov, but Alfred Dublin, William Carlos Williams. There's so many doctors among the ranks of great literary writers. So I just wondered if you can speculate about why and about how you think differently of the two roles. Mm. Well, I, it's, it's really hard for me to say what would happen if I were not a doctor. Since I'm a doctor, you know, since I was 23. So I'm 59 now, so I really got used to it. Uh, it's like it's like asking, you know, twins, how is it to have an identical copy of yours? And they would say, how, how, how it is not to have one? Because, you know, they, they used to. Fair so, and I think, uh, well, of course, medicine gives some uh, some, you know, uh, close, you know, sort of affinity with, with uh, real life, so-called real life. Although I think the influence of medicine itself on writing is a bit exaggerated. Uh, because if I were a chemist, say, or, uh, you know, whoever, insurance or agent. insurance agent, I would have different set of metaphors, definitely, but uh, the writing itself, uh, I'm, not, I'm not writing about medicine, it's, I, I use it uh, as a material uh, because I have to write on the material I know about. So I write about on the material of medicine or politics or chess or religion or theater, uh, you know, some, some topics that I, I'm more familiar with than with others. Uh, music, of course. Uh, but I would, uh, since I was a, a publisher for many years, and I published medical texts, and I tried to make them as mm, precise and short, and you know, and to omit all unnecessary words, uh, <clears throat> I edited many, many big books. I think that may 
maybe that affected my writing style more than than uh, working in the hospital itself. Yeah, is there a poetry to medical textbooks? One of the characters in this collection is a translator of like medical texts and sociological texts and so on, and he thinks there's a great poetry and art to his profession. So I was wondering, did you find much poetry? Well, we tried to honor? we tried to put it somehow. I mean, not yeah, not the some some artistic things, yeah, some language uh, tricks, you know, things. Uh, yeah, I think. Yeah, you, you could, although it seems to be boring, very dull thing, right, to, to edit medical texts. But in fact, uh, for a doctor, it's, it, it could be. Yeah, the passage is very of moving game. about yeah, these yeah. translations. That was yeah. one of my favorite parts in the collection. Yeah. Um, so I also wanted to ask you why short stories. Um, is this, am I doing this right? You can hear me. Okay. Um, so in an interview on the LIRB, you say, I think I prefer short stories, even long short stories, my personal preference, because mm -hmm. um, they can be closer to poetry than to novels. It's not the subject matter I find central to short fiction, but the style and form, which far exceed content and their importance. And then you say that they're more demanding than novels. So I generally tend to prefer novels, uh, but I find your stories actually uniquely novelistic, which I don't mean as a sort of slur. So I wonder, first of all, why are they closer to poetry? And why is that better? And then also, how do you classify essays? Because of course, this collection has both short stories and essays, or essays. Mm -hmm. Where do they fall on the novel poetry continuum? Uh -huh. Well, uh, I think that uh, there are certain features of short stories that that uh, make them closer to to poetry or even to music than to to, to big novels. Uh, first of all, we, when we first read them, well, first of all, it requires a lot of attention and a lot of work from the reader because if you miss a few words, you can miss the whole the whole poem, you know, the whole thing uh, in the short story. Uh, second, uh, when we read or when we read poetry or when we read, when we listen to to a new, you know, piece of music. Uh, for the first time, we do it in order to decide whether it it worth listening it at all, and then we reread it or listen to it again and again. So I read Chekhov's stories, you know, limitless amount, dozens amount of uh, times, uh, and each time I found some you know very small things that really you know changed. Uh, the meaning and you know the atmosphere and even the characters well and it's 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 very attractive thing I think to to build a character uh, from just few few words uh, because characters is you know the most important part of literature right we we live with these characters all our lives and, uh, not with plots not with uh, stories Know, but with characters, you know, because stories, you know, plots could be very similar, uh, but but characters, you know, they are unique. Okay. How do you think of the character in relation to the like essayistic component of this book? I mean, it seems to me that there is a character, and the character is namely you, mm -hmm. uh, and maybe this relates to your remarks about how a doctor uh, is a neutral creature, mm -hmm. but a writer is present. You mm -hmm. know, so do you think you're the character in the essays? Yeah, I think so. Well, I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. I found that to be yeah. so. So you succeeded. Well, and I, I must say that these essays—it's not a journalistic work; it's it's work of writers. So it would probably not, but it, it surely would not pass uh, how to call it fact check, you know. In, <laughs> in, in, in America. so it's uh, because I combine several people into into one person, or you know, you you can change. And they're impressionistic. Yeah. They're not boringly yeah. written essays, mm -hmm. such as you would find in a magazine. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I wanted to ask also about the relationship between music and sort of other like formal systems and the way that you conceive of your writing. Like, I, well, first I wanted to ask about your chess background because there's some chess in a few stories in this, well, in chess this is, book. Well, chess is not a background. It's just a bad habit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one of the and it characters. It is a sign of, of lost 
you know, lost youth or whatever. Yeah, my, my husband <laughs> also plays online chess, so there's a character in the book oh. who plays online chess yeah, compulsively, yeah. and until he feels like he's going to throw up, I showed that part to my husband because he has a bad online chess habit as well. Um, but so I guess it seemed to me maybe like there's some kind of like formal relationship between the formal qualities of these stories and the formal qualities of like, the chess game. Although I'm terrible at chess and don't understand how that would work, so I want you to tell me. <laughs> well, chess is a form of it, it's very special uh, thing game. Well, I'm not a, a professional not at all, so my rating is like. What is your rating? Eight, I actually well, don't know it's this. Eighteen hundred. That's something. very high for. Uh, for well, a, for Blitz, it's not not too high. But well, anyway. Don't tell my uh, husband that his rating is that too. Yeah. Plus, I love to you know after having some wine, I love to play chess. You know, so with my rating goes down in the evening. Yeah, in the evening it goes down. So, but, uh, you know, chess is, uh, it's a strange thing. I, I met several chess players and it is like a room where you can bring like best 10 mathematicians in the world or 10 best, you know, poets in the world. But uh, in fact, you cannot do it with poetry or mathematics because, because no one would agree who is the best and you know what what are criteria for that but with chess players it's very easy there is a rating and they get together and they have sort of you know they create something together uh, and they are generally they are nice people smart nice but but there is nothing that comes out of it that's paradoxical you know it's not that if you are the best chess player you would be uh, the best, you know, battlefield you know, commander, or the best, uh, you know, architect, or whatever. It's it's just you know playing chess in order to play chess, and it's it's also a bit you know strange strange situation. Yeah, it's there. A very so yeah, so endeavor. yeah, so chess, you know, it's it's a separate thing. You asked about music. Yes. Music is more. Well, music. Uh, I'm surrounded by musicians. My wife is a pianist, my daughter is a violinist, my son-in-law is a viola player, and, you know, my daughter and my son-in-law, they live in Frankfurt, and they, well, the whole family lives in Frankfurt these days, so, but they, uh, they lived there for a while, since 2014, and they are, you know, quite well known in, in Europe, in Germany, uh, specifically, they won several, you know, competitions with their, uh, quartet. It's Elliot Quartet. Uh, and, you know, each uh, parent, I think, well, at least I belong to this category, is uh, like Chekhov's darling, you know, who really, you know, the darling who, who, uh, so for me the whole music now is divided in two parts. It's, it's string quartets and, and the rest of the music. <laughs> so, um, and, uh, well, I think uh, for a writer it's, uh, the best uh, teacher of composition, really, because I never really, uh, I, I never had any problems with composition itself. I never changed parts of the story. I, I, I heard that other writers do have this kind of. I certainly so, have problems with yeah, composition. Yeah, but you know, something should 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 be easy, you know, relatively, <laughs> yeah, come Maybe. by itself, you know. Well, so I have difficulties in finding the right tone, finding names. That's why many of my uh, characters have no names, which is maybe not uh, very convenient for, for a reader, but I, it's also a challenge you know, to write. Uh, and, uh, you know, with other things, but not with composition. So what elements of the music I mean, I was thinking that a lot of these stories are very polyphonic, like mm -hmm. many of them will open with mm -hmm. the, something from one character's mm -hmm. perspective, one character thinking about another character, and then the rest of the story will be from the perspective of the second character, and mm -hmm. will totally dispel the first character's presuppositions. Mm -hmm. Is it like the polyphony of the music that is? Yeah, the it's polyphony. It's uh, the fact that, like in poetry, you have, in music, you can have some, some you know, more, I would say informative parts, but metrically they would have the same uh, the same size as you know just some intermediate uh, things. But they are also necessary. You cannot 
Uh, otherwise, it would be like anthem, you know, something. Yeah, yeah. To, uh, so, it's like yeah. modulation as well, like modulation. Yeah, and modulation, and, you know, uh, and, and, you know, and the, uh, you know, music is very brave to sometimes just to, to change completely, very quickly to switch to somewhat else. And, uh, and also, I think the speed, uh, with, uh, for example, this um, uh, story that we just heard has very uh, quick. You know the tempo is uh, like allegro, yes. uh, and uh, some stories are like adagio. You, and and, and within a story, you, sh you 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 should you know change the tempo. Otherwise, otherwise it would be too monotonous. You mm. know. So if I were you know brave enough, uh, I would put you know allegro, market. yeah, or <laughs> presto. You know, well, it's not too Largo. late. Because huh? it's not too late. You can do that. Next um, so then I think I want you to teach American fiction writers something, which is how to write good political fiction. So people compare you all the time to Chekhov, but I think, well, I mean, I don't know. That's a, that's a merited comparison and a flattering comparison, but I was reminded more of Vasily Grossman when I was reading your stories. Okay. I'm probably saying his name in a way that a Russian would not recognize. Vasily Grossman. Ah, Vasily yes. Grossman. Yes. <laughs> oh, Vasily Grossman wrote yeah. a big, big... So, I mean, it is like a completely different scale, but I think that uh, you both do a really good job of writing politically complicated stories that represent people at the absolute pinnacle of debasement and also at the absolute pinnacle of, like, I don't know, doing a great job. And, and these characters, like the one in Big Opportunities, who managed to combine these contradictions. So I wonder what you think makes for good and not didactic political writing, because you do it so well in a way that's reminiscent to me of Vasily Grossman, despite his proclivity for like 900 page novels and yours for short stories. Well, I would, well, I, I don't like comparisons at all. I think Fair. no, 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 uh, really. No Chekhov. Writers love them. Uh, so, I would no, like to be compared to Chekhov. I love Chekhov, of course. I don't, I don't really like Grossman that, that much. I love Trifon, you know, uh, who is, I think, uh, not very well known, to put it mildly, here in America. But he was a, one of the greatest writers of the 20th century, Yuri Trifonov. Okay. And I'm, I'm sure he was translated into English. Uh, he died in 1975, so he was considered to be sort of Soviet writer. In fact, he was, I mean, he was just a very good writer, regardless of all you know, uh, this. Um, uh, so, um, so, uh, what was the question? <laughs> I mean, that's good to know. I'll take a recommendation. I mean, I have been really disappointed by, I mean, not to offend anyone, but I've been very disappointed by American fictional responses ah, to Trump. I thought it. that they're very didactic and they're kind of, you know, Trump is the enemy, Trump is the dictator, and it's very irritating to read. And your fiction is politically engaged, but politically subtle. Uh, as is your nonfiction, and so please tell us how uh, we can do this. Well, I'm not sure I would be able to, to write uh, about Trump in any other. Uh, Trump demands buffoonish yeah. fiction, it's true. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, uh, that's why it makes it so difficult to write about present uh, uh, Russian politics, which is, you know, it, it, it's not black and white, it's, it's just black. And uh, it's not, uh, it's not that, you know, it, it's not, it's not a journalistic or social political uh, work, uh, but you still need to find. Well, I think, uh, you know, try to understand, try to understand, uh, you know, even even uh, the, the the ugly person somehow. Uh, I, I don't. I don't think I. I really have much, much to say about that. It's just. That's fair. Yeah, but you. Yeah. I mean, you do a good job. So mm -hmm. thank you. Well, thank you. For saying that. <laughs> um, so there's a line from Chekhov that you allude to uh, in one of, well, I guess, in an essay, "My Native Land," which is, mm -hmm. "Dislike of life, strangely combined with the fear of death, is what characterizes a 
a lot of your patients. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, at first glance, that seems like the guardian logic of many of your stories. There's like people who are miserable yet terrified to die. And yet at second glance, something that really strikes me about your fiction is the quiet strain of joy and dignity uh, in the various people's lives. Like for example, this translator of textbooks who infuses his mm -hmm. translations with such art. Uh, and you yourself autobiographically you say, one, I'm gonna read a quote, uh, from one of the essays. I'm hurrying into my office, plugging in the machinery, things start to hum. I slip on my white coat, look at the velvety gloom outside, and tell myself, one, this is as good as it'll ever get, and two, this is what happiness is, which I love uh, and found very moving. Um, so I wondered if you could just say something about the sort of like unique blend of not just pessimism with a desire to keep living, but pessimism with optimism, uh, because so many characters who find themselves in horrible circumstances nonetheless find themselves able to take joy in mundane things. Well, uh, I, I immediately recall uh, the quote from uh, Chekhov, it's Dom's uh, Mezzanine, I'm not sure how it is translated, uh, house with the, I don't know, Mezzanine, well, whatever. Uh, about misuse, about about love, uh, and he was irritated with uh, questions about you know uh, discussion about that modern people are so you know uh, pessimistic. Uh, why am, why are they so pessimistic? Uh, why are not they optimistic? Whatever, and he says uh, the the problem is not with optimism or pessimism, but that 99 out of 100 have no brains. <laughs> so many of my characters uh, are, you know, they are, they are, they can call, they can be called, you know, stupid sometimes. <laughs> uh, but still, uh, you know, it's it's interesting. Uh, you know, in, in in book one there is a story, the mill. Uh, it's about very very bad physician. Uh, and it, it is about the internal world of the person uh, who in fact has no internal world at all. <laughs> so, and it was, you know, it, it was an interesting task for me. And try to, to look at things from his, you know, perspective. But yeah, many so. of them are not stupid. I mean, many of them are very smart, like this translator. And like, the, there's a one story about a literary director of a theater in a small town, which is called Eternity, and the story is called After Eternity because the town has been liquidated by the authorities, and he's forced to move and abandon everything. And he's not a stupid character. No, no, he's, very he's smart not. And he's well, he's a very kind person. That makes him really attractive, I think, uh, to most. Of I mean, I and you could, you could feel his kindness, although he could be very naive at the same uh, time and and uh, very fatalistic, you know, which is another uh, feature of many uh, many Russians, which is you know could be even helpful in days like like uh, like these. But he has such unexpected hope. I wanted to read also this line because this is maybe my favorite in both of the two books. You should buy both. You should, of course, buy the one that's new. But so he's he's in this new town and he's probably dying. He's ill. Um, he says it's only from time to time that I'll take stock, not of what is, what's all around me, and think how I'll miss it all of it. I didn't manage to see very much, to learn very much, but I'll miss many many things. Not only trees and rivers, flakes of snow, and the beam of a searchlight. Poems, first and foremost. Is there no way to take them with me? Just a handful. Uh, which I thought was, I don't know, a beautiful expression of optimism. Um, I'm sorry to read you so many quotes. No, no, I, I love it. <laughs> uh, so the next question is also about a quote, which is another quote that I that I love. Uh, it's it's from this translator. This translator is definitely my favorite character in in this book, uh, and he's thinking about his mother's death, and. He, this is what's in the book. Some time ago, he had been commissioned to translate a book of conversations on moral themes in which he had read that to love someone is to say to them, you will never die. From then on, he had refused to construct a picture of the world in which his mother did not exist. So I thought that was beautiful. So first, I wondered uh, where that's from, if it's actually from a book of conversations on moral themes. No, no, I, it's I, not. <laughs> I was looking for it. Um, <laughs> Well, that's good to know, looking <laughs> futilely. Um, is that what it is to love somebody? I thought that was a wonderful way of thinking about love. Well, it is uh, from 
one, you know, gospel, do say gospel, well, of, um, uh, there is a, uh, his name was Metropolitan Antoni of Suraj, he lived in London, and he was very well-known, you know, priest and bishop, um, and it was his, actually, uh, from one of his, you know, sayings about, about, you know, uh, it impressed me very much, so, yeah, seems, it this way, yeah. Me too. It yeah. seems right to me. Yeah. Um, well, okay, I have more questions. I have infinite questions um, okay. and more quotes that I've, that I've copied and pasted. Um, so I guess on the one hand, your characters are very cosmopolitan and you yourself are very cosmopolitan and speak so many languages and so on. On the no, other hand, no, I, I speak only, only Well, you speak two very some. well. Well, your books are, you fooled me because there's many like quotes in French and the books are multilingual and <laughs> cosmopolitan in outlook, I suppose, if not in uh, content. Um, but they're so intimately tethered to this particular small town, so much of what you write, fictionalized in various guises, sometimes it's other small towns like this town of eternity. So you write in this piece in the Atlantic about fleeing from Russia. Uh, Home is wherever you hang your hat, an outlook on life that has always appealed to you. It's a lot easier to adopt it than you'd previously thought. Uh, but since so many of these stories are so intimately tethered to this particular, and not, not like a cosmopolitan place, like a deliberately small town that is 101 kilometers away from Moscow. So I wonder how you reconcile these two, these two strains, the enormously cosmopolitan strain and the enormously local strain. Well, I think uh, I started to write when I moved to Tarusa, um, and uh, I, you know, I, I really love this small town. Uh, so for me, thinking of home, it would always be, uh, you know, about Tarusa. I don't think I would ever have uh, any other real home. Uh, although I understand very well that it is. You know, healthier in a way uh, to think that I would never uh, probably go there again. Although I have hopes, and uh, my parents are buried there, uh, and uh, you know, I have a uh, beautiful house there, uh, which is now just closed. You know, and so that's why. And and you know, but sometimes it's uh, uh, there is a feeling that maybe it is a plan. You know, somehow we. In fact, I understand that our lives do not have, uh, do not have, um, you know, fabula. Uh, there is no plot in our life. Although very often we bring some some fabula into it, you know, saying, "Oh, this is because that and that. I got sick because, you know, uh, you know, because of some, you know, sins or whatever, because I did something wrong there." So we we you know bring plots and bring. You know, fabulous, but in fact there is no no fabulous. The, that's the difference actually between you know stories and and life. When people say you know you should uh, use this and all that, but this is not. I mean, they they, they have totally different nature. Uh, so sometimes I I really have feeling while in 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 the Netherlands, you know, uh, often it happens. Uh, in, in the trains, you know, they have very good, very, very fast trains and semi-empty. So, you know, with this high speed and you, you feel like, you know, okay, maybe it's it's a plan uh, about me, you know, so, I, yeah. So this is, that's why I put it there, the, the, that way. Yeah. Um, if life doesn't have a plot, does it have some literary qualities? Because your essays are so autobiographical, and I mean, maybe they're not, they wouldn't withstand a fact checking, but they have a great liter literariness to them. Uh, do you think that life has other literary qualities, if not a plot? No, well, I, I of course, I select facts and, and thoughts and, you know, things. So there is no, not a big difference between essays. And, uh, and and fictional short stories. The only difference is when I say I, me, you know, it's it's me, Maxim Osipov there. Uh, or at least someone who pretends to be, you know, <laughs> me. Uh, in, in, in the fictional short story, you can, you can do it, you know. Well, 
Like, so, together. yeah, but so, and of course I bring, like, like the last um, essay there, it's uh, Children of Junk Boy. And I, uh, for many years, I wanted to write a story, uh, Dieti Junk Boy. You know, in, in Russian, I think it sounds so, so good. Dieti Junk Boy, this, the, the, you know, and, and I, I really, Junk Boy is a, a, a town in, in Crimea, actually. And so it, uh, I heard this uh, combination of words when the, um, some you know, small local officials came to the hospital in order to collect money uh, after invasion of, uh, after Russia invaded Crimea, to collect money in order to help to Dieti Jankoy, to children of Jankoy. And you know, I made a joke saying, why are we collecting money? To children of Chankoy, let's collect money to help children of California because they, we have not invaded it yet. <laughs> you know, the poor, poor kids. And, and, and now, you know, uh, and they, they were, it was taken, you know, like, okay. But then, you know, people still, you know, collected some money, not, not much, but, you know, some, some like 15,000 rubles, whatever. And then, and for many years, I thought, well, Dieti Jankoy, I should really make something out of it for, for a few years. And then um, I thought maybe it would be a horse, you know, Jankoy, nice, nice name for a horse or a dog, maybe, you know, and dogs, you know, some There's small lots of dogs, dogs is, yeah, and whatever. And then, and then uh, after my mother died, uh, I had, uh, uh, you know, a group of people from the hospital, like nurses, uh, even you know cleaners, uh, other doctors, they collected some money and brought them to me. And I said, like, what am I, you know, a child of John Coy? I mean, but but that for me it was the. Uh, I thought now I can write, you know, yeah, I can write a story. They there. they brought money in order to help with funeral, whatever, which was not really necessary. I I had enough money for that, but. Still, it was moving, you know, and it was done the same way people collected to, you know, to children of Chan Khoi and to me and, you know. Not yet and, children of California. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, did I, does yeah. it answer, you know? I mean, so insofar as such a question can ever be answered, yeah. how literary yeah. life is, who knows? Yeah. Right. Um, so one more quote that I'll ask you to comment on, I'm sorry, this is just how I read as a person used to quoting things in big chunks and commenting on them. So there's a story called Cape Cod, which is set in the Boston area and parts of it in Cape Cod, but part of it takes place in Brookline. Um, and there's a conversation between the protagonist, who is the one who emigrates to the Boston area, in fact to Boston, and his father. And his father says, emigration is a disaster, a mental illness. Uh, and the character says, and staying here, is that not an illness? And his father replies, it is, just a different kind. You still need a homeland for something. And then he thinks, or the narrator, the narratorial consciousness of the story thinks, for something, yes, but for what? Mm -hmm. So that made me wonder, what is it that you need a homeland for, if anything? Yeah, well, it's, yeah, it's... Uh, also unanswerable, but... <laughs> well, I think, uh, yeah, thank you for picking it up. Uh, and I think both of them are right. You know, I think immigration is is a mental illness, and I think that staying in Russia these days would be another illness. You know, another mental illness. A moral illness. illness. Uh, yeah, and uh, and you need homeland for something, and you know, and that's the, the the question to be answered. For what? And actually, this story I think answers this question. For what? Uh, although maybe, you know. Well, and plus, I think that questions very often are more interesting than answers, right? I, so, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, lots of characters emigrate and are, yeah, are confused Yeah, it's the whole thing. It. I mean, kilometer. I think we should uh, explain the concept of kilometer oh, 101. Please. Uh, yeah, uh, it's uh, uh, my, uh, well, um, ex-prisoners in USSR uh, not only at Stalin time, but even later on, they were not allowed to stay in big cities. Uh, and they called it like minus 30, minus 50, means minus 30 cities, like 
uh, Moscow, Leningrad, Kiev, Tbilisi, whatever. You were not allowed to Novosibirsk, whatever. Uh, so my great grandfather, who was a doctor and who was accused uh, falsely, of course, uh, to of attempt to murdering Gorky and, and uh, son of Gorky, and there were like uh, the the whole group of doctors uh, that was accused was like almost like 400, uh, and he spent certain years um, in uh, far north, well, not, it's Belamar Canal, you know, it's, it's north. Uh, and, uh, and then he was not allowed to, after he was released, he was not allowed to, to, to live in Moscow, where his family was, so he found finally this place in Tarusa. So uh, Tarusa was, you know, geographically exactly kilometer 101. So the, the whole province, you know, it's, it's, I never named Tarusa there in the book. Uh, so, but uh, the, the whole idea of, you know, the, the center for me, of course, is, you know, Moscow and, uh, you know, everything that is just, uh, you know, flying away, away from Moscow, it could be. That's why the, the whole book is about, you know, either Russian provinces or even, you know, Cape Cod or even An Rome problem. or, yeah. Wherever it's it's just about uh, our characters in uh, transit. Running, yeah, in transit, going to somewhere. You know. yeah. yeah, I wondered if you have familiarity with the Boston area because you spoke about it with such authority. Are well, you? I spent yeah, I've, I've been here many many times. Okay. Okay. I mean, that exhausts my questions. Although I can think of more if you guys. Well, thank you very much. Great. I will. I mean, I will ask great, you more great. questions when we talk after yeah, yeah, sure. the infinite questions. So now we can take questions from the audience, I guess, right? Please. Pardon me. Could you speak? How do I find my literary voice? It's a hard one. Another unanswerable one. Well, I'm not. Well, it's it's the endless process. I'm each time I'm writing, I try to find it. So uh, it's uh, it's not that it was found, and you know, here we go from now on. I will speak this voice. You know, it's it's uh, you know, it is the ongoing thing, always. Uh, well, not poems. I'm not a poet. Uh, definitely not. Uh, well, I could consider, but I, I don't think really. Well, I would love to, but it. Well, it's. Uh, it doesn't really matter. I think that much. Maybe it does for for publishers, but but for uh, for me, you know, as long as I feel, it, it's like you know, uh, uh, digging for for gold. You know, as long as you you can be lucky and find uh, a big piece of gold, you know, very very lucky, or you can just find a sand. But as long as the material is gold, you know, whether it's sand or you know, somewhat bigger, you are fine. You are doing the right thing. Uh, so if I'm lucky and you know I find a big piece of gold, then of course I would not. I, I hope I would not. Uh, uh, miss it, and I, I, I would try to, to, you know, not to be lazy and you know, <laughs> do it. Yeah. Nothing wrong with the story. Yeah. I wonder about your relationship with your translators because you speak English, uh, American. Well, uh, well, relations um, are as follows. Uh, when I finish, well, I, I when I write a story, I try never to think about translation because otherwise uh, even you know these days uh, many people uh, many writers some writers at least uh, while writing they are thinking on you know how it would sound in English uh, and therefore they really 
have no individual style but so-called world literature you know it's because every everybody wants to be translated into into English and uh, so it's it's really you know dangerous thing to do but then when I finish the story and I do not really want to to leave it uh, because it's you know such a joy to you know to improve it, to spoil it, then again improve it. You know, it's it's a matter of quality, not of existence. When it is done, uh, then at the end, I'm <clears throat> uh, uh, I put uh, I put uh, footnotes for translators, uh, commenting every difficult word, uh, word or difficult circumstances that are not readily understandable or uh, say sources of quotes saying uh, this is you know proverb and this is not a proverb although it looks like proverb so don't try to find it in phraseological dictionary or whatever and this comes from you know uh, uh, shakespeare uh, not shakespeare pushkin and uh, this is from you know everyone knows it so you may admit it uh, whatever so i i do that and then uh, well, with English, well, since uh, English is the only foreign language that I, I can read, uh, my English translators, they send me drafts, and uh, I sometimes I have some comments that are, they find it, them acceptable, although, uh, although they know English so, you know, far better than I do, that I, they, they, Usually, not usually, but I would say in 50% of cases, they change something if I say, well, for me it sounds not really, but not the way I suggest, really. <laughs> and, uh, no, because they, they really, it's, you know, it's, it's impossible. I, I wouldn't be able to translate my works into English in, in no way. And uh, plus, languages are so different uh, that uh, you cannot, you you just you know cannot uh, stick on you know certain music musically it's difficult uh, different and uh, and of course I don't I didn't read much of English literature so I I do not know like I, I asked Boris with this story why not great opportunities and he answered me immediately well Dickens is still present there <laughs> believe me. Uh, because I was thinking of course about uh, great expectations. And, you know, I thought this kind of game, and uh, well, people when they speak about translations, they very often they uh, speak about losses, you know, lost in translation, whatever. Uh, I would really love my translators to write and assess, uh, you know, gained in translation, because you you can you can you know gain something in in translation too, and I think uh, I'm very very happy to have this, you know. Boris and, and the whole team of translators, translators to, to do it. There's good reflections on translation in the story with the translator, which yeah, I recommend. Yeah, and, and uh, of yeah. course these works are translated not only onto English, so I have very good relations with my French translator, with uh, Spanish, Catalan, yeah, well, a few others. But there are, on some languages, there are, there are miserable miserable translations and you can you can you can say it immediately you know even like in Albanian I, I don't know Albanian not even you know slightest idea but but you know looking at your text you can you can very easily find it the translation is awful my question is more an extension of, of, a, uh, of an observation that Becca made, that your writing isn't explicitly political, or it doesn't mm -hmm. have a contrived political valence. Mm -hmm. And there's a discourse that keeps coming up cyclically, that is, what is the author's relationship to, to strike and to war and to society? Um, given what's happening in, in Russia, um, mm -hmm. uh, in, in Ukraine, in fact, uh, I'd, I'd like to pose that question to you, that how does that figure into how you conceive of the author's role in society today? Well, uh, I, I was asked uh, some similar question in, in Amsterdam during big, uh, you know, there was a um, uh, uh, sort of a uh, 
how to say it, it's not parliament, it's, it's more a forum, you know, democratic, whatever forum, the Bali they call it. Um, and I said, uh, well, that uh, for the author, the most important word uh, these days would be, would be humility, really. I think that uh, the destiny of the world uh, depends much more on Ukrainian soldiers, on how much uh, aid uh, the West can provide to them, and not on us at all. So humility, I think, would be the uh, you know the best uh, the best uh, work these days. Yeah. Well, for poets, it could be slightly different because poetry. The, there is a great poetry uh, came up recently from this war, anti-war poetry. Uh, but with poetry, it's, um, um, you know, uh, when, when something really hurts and you cry, uh, that could make poetry, but not, not prose. So you need some time and some distance uh, for, for the prose, yeah, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please. I'd like to turn that question in the opposite direction. How do you think the political events have writing or have they and you you have the fortune of writing in Russia during a golden open period mm -hmm. if you had been born 20 years earlier or 30 years earlier would you have been able to write like you're right now mm. well uh, it's uh, uh, well there are there are two questions uh, so first question is how uh, politics actually influenced my writing, right? So uh, there are certain stories that I'm, I'm very pleased that I wrote them because I would not write them now. It's just because this, their mm -hmm. themes, their uh, you know, subject is not, is not really something that, uh, that would uh, get my attention at all. Uh, so of course, all our thoughts uh, these days are somehow related with uh, war, with anger, with guilt, with disgust, with uh, you know, with immigration, uh, or staying, or immigrate. You know, th this kind of, of topics. Uh, or you can you can write a, one can write a love story, but still it would be a love story uh, during the war, right? Uh, so, as for um, the second question, uh, was, uh, was, was, yeah, I'm sorry. Writing during the opium period versus... Ah, well, it was totally different, totally different society with totally different interest to a, uh, to, to a literature, I would say. So, uh, the print runs of uh, literary magazines uh, were up to like three million copies, five million copies. It's it's unimaginable uh, at you know uh, Soviet, uh, you know in the in the seventies, say. Uh, and uh, also you know censorship, how to trick censorship, uh, this kind of thing. So it was it was di it would be different, of course. Yeah, of course it would be totally different. I I cannot really imagine. Uh, of you know, maybe I wouldn't try it at all. I, I don't know. And um, like speaking of different time periods, like you no longer live in Russia, right? Or yeah, yeah, for a year. I, I immigrated. What does that mean for ago. you as a Russian author getting your book published? Well, I don't know if if there is a, any way to do that. Uh, well, things got well. First of all, there is. Uh, internet. So, secondly, uh, I, 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 I've never really very much was, you know, dependent on my, on, on publishing my books in Russian. And uh, also, I recently, uh, with the help of my Dutch publishers, I recently started a new magazine, anthology, we call it The Fifth Wave. And uh, the first issue will come up in, in a month from now or so. Uh, so uh, 
at least I have a place to <laughs> to publish my stories, uh, if any. Uh, but uh, so it would be a bilingual. Well, it would be uh, two separate uh, uh, books, but you know, uh, at the size of Granta magazine or Paris Review magazine, two hundred something pages. Uh, you know, not a big format. Just if you if you know how how Grant or Paris Review looks like. Uh, so it would be Russian and uh, English uh, English versions, English translations of non-censored um, magazine in Russian. So and we called it Fifth Wave because it's the fifth wave of uh, Russian immigration. Tell us a little bit more about your work for, t for theater and with theater. Well, uh, it's uh, it was uh, uh, I came, you know, I I really started it very late in the course of my life. For many years, I haven't been to the theater. Then, um, with uh, two friends, both of whom are present here, I went to Famenka Theater in uh, Moscow. And I immediately fall in love with it, and I said, "Okay, I will. I need to make a, a, a play for them." And then there was a, uh, a long, you know, uh, a number of, of funny and sad uh, things that happened to me because when you get into the uh, totally new, uh, you know, uh, totally new. Uh, atmosphere, something you never did before. You make a lot of funny mistakes. Uh, and uh, theatrical life, it's very, very intense. And, uh, it, you know, there are a lot of things that are happening that you never really ever noticed. Like uh, uh, each relation with uh, almost everyone in the theater, uh, they have like uh, falling in love, uh, then betrayal, then, uh, you know, forgiveness, you know, all this, you know, because this is media, which uh, actors, uh, you know, they live in, uh, like, like, you know, in this, this media, they need it. And I almost, I noticed almost nothing. Uh, and that's why, you know, many, many funny things happen. But I cannot really say that I understand uh, the theater and the na you know nature of this uh, art very well. So I am still uh, you know in, in sort of out 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 outside or whatever. Uh, I I don't know if I ever write another another. I have three plays, but I don't think I would uh, ever uh, get back to it, especially here. In which language? Russian would that be? Actor hmm? and actress here now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, well, this story, by the way, uh, that you quoted in English, it's called After Eternity. They are going to stage it in Amsterdam. I have. Oh, great! Uh, yeah. I should go. When? Yes. Yeah. Uh, they said by the end of this year, so in November. December. Although, but it will be in Dutch. Yeah. Okay. So we're probably just the impressionist, yeah. like, get the vibes. Yeah. Yeah. Very handsome actor. Yeah. <laughs> That's all that matters, really. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yes. I think that's it then. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.